problems with Thomas More's Richard III. Sir Thomas More's King Richard III has long been a go-to account of the events of 1483 and the life and reign of King Richard III, even amongst academic historians. But there are so many demonstrable errors in the text that it's worrying that it should be used as anything more than a secondary source. So here we are, we're going to talk about the top 10 problems with Sir Thomas More's Richard III. Number one, he was born in 1478. Okay, not a problem in and of itself, but it means that he was five years old at the time of the events that he's describing in 1483. We know that he writes his account probably between 1512 and 1519, so over 30 years after the events that he's discussing. As many people will claim, quite rightly, Thomas More probably had the chance to interview people who had been around the events of 1483 and had been witnesses to what had happened. But as we'll see later, there's reason to doubt some of the testimony they had, and there's reasons for those people to have tried to distance themselves from Richard III's decisions and from his regime. Because Thomas More was five in 1483, he can't have been an eyewitness to any of the events that he describes. And this is why we find his account littered with caveats such as, as men say, or I have constantly heard. It's because he can't always vouch for what he's saying, what he's relating are at least second-hand, if not third-hand stories. That ought to give us pause for thought, and it should mean that More's account can never be anything more than a secondary source at best. Number two, he was a member of John Morton's household. John Morton, as Bishop of Ely, was an inveterate enemy of King Richard III. He was arrested on the 13th of June, 1483, and placed in the custody of the Duke of Buckingham. He would later escape and flee to the continent and become close to Henry Tudor. After 1485, he became a pillar of the early Tudor government. And in 1486, he was created Archbishop of Canterbury, promoted from Bishop of Ely. Thomas More was in John Morton's household as a page between 1490 and 1492, so between the ages of 12 and 14. There's been lots of suggestions that More's manuscript was actually John Morton's work, but if it isn't, it's at least heavily influenced by what he'd heard from his old master. We know also that Thomas More never completed his work and he never published it. It was published in 1548 by his nephew, William Rastall, 13 years after More's execution. Did he stop writing? Because he found out amongst his research that what his old master had told him wasn't quite the truth. The fact remains though, that More never really meant us to read his work on Richard III. Number three, the very first sentence of More's work is a mistake. The very first sentence of Thomas More's Richard III is a demonstrable error. The very first sentence of Thomas More's account states that King Edward of that name the fourth, after he had lived fifty and three years, seven months and six days, and thereof reigned two and twenty years, one month, the eight days, died at Westminster the ninth day of April. Edward the fourth was actually nineteen days short of his forty-first birthday when he passed away. This is a pretty wide discrepancy, and for a lawyer who people claim would have meticulously researched his facts and surely wouldn't lie about what he'd found out. This is an odd thing to find at the very, very beginning of his work, and surely something that would have been fairly easy to check. What I really wonder is whether this is a genuine mistake that Moore made, which would make him unreliable right from the outset, or whether this is a deliberate signpost that what he's writing isn't historical fact, but it's allegory. It may be interesting that Henry VII passed away at the age of 52, much closer to Moore's estimation. So maybe Moore's tale of frightening tyranny has less to do with Edward IV's successor and more to do with Henry VII's. Number four, Richard really wanted to kill Henry VI. On the death of the last Lancastrian king, Moore wrote of Richard that he slew with his own hand King Henry VI being prisoner in the tower, as men constantly say, and that without commandment or knowledge of the king, who would undoubtedly, if he had intended such a thing, have appointed that butcherly office to some other than his own born brother. Thomas More has his Richard III killing the old king Henry VI without his brother's awareness or instruction. And that's just nonsense. If anyone was behind the death of Henry VI, it was almost certainly Edward IV. What More is trying to do here is create a character who we are aware is, is keen to kill. He wants to do the deed. He wants to do it before someone else can take the pleasure away from him. And that's just setting it up for someone who wants to kill two small children. Number five. The pre-contract accusation is muddled. Moore makes the claim that part of the pre-contract story that emerged in 1483 was that Edward IV himself was illegitimate, as well as his children. He wrote that the chief thing and the most weighty of all that invention rested in this. They should allege bastardy, either in King Edward himself 
or in his children, or both. In this, he has a, a little bit of contemporary support, but that support comes from Dominic Mancini, who is a source also riddled with problems who may well feature in a future top 10 problems with. The fact is that every other contemporary source only says that the pre-contract story involved a bigamous marriage between Edward IV and a previous wife that made all of his children by Elizabeth Woodville illegitimate and incapable of taking the throne. Mancini in 1483 had probably picked up on a, a current French story, a joke at Edward IV's expense, that he was in fact the son of an English archer named Blaybourne, who his mother had had an affair with. Mancini didn't speak any English, so perhaps just assumed that the story that was in circulation was that French joke that he'd heard on the continent. Moore simply repeats the false, incorrect story. Number six, Moore gets a key name wrong. There's more confusion about the pre-contract story in 1483 from Thomas Moore. He names the lady involved as Dame Elizabeth Lucy. She was amongst Edward IV's alleged mistresses, but Moore says that she was the subject of the pre-contract story and that she gave testimony that she had never been married to Edward IV at all. But Moore gets the name wrong. The lady involved in the pre-contract story was in fact Lady Eleanor Butler, who had been born Lady Eleanor Talbot, the daughter of the first Earl of Shrewsbury. She had died in 1468, but had been alive at the time that Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville had married, thus making their union bigamous if the marriage was true. The fact that Moore gets this key name wrong ought to give us lots and lots of concern. We're told again, he's a lawyer. He would have meticulously researched this work. He wouldn't publish lies. He would have checked all of his facts, but he gets this central name to the story completely and utterly wrong. Number seven, Lord Stanley at the council meeting. There's a famous council meeting on the 13th of June, 1483, at which Lord Hastings is executed for treason. Bishop Morton, who we mentioned earlier, is arrested and Archbishop Rotherham of York is also arrested. During the story of the council meeting, Thomas More has Richard expose his arm to show that he has a withered arm as a result of witchcraft on the part of his enemies. He claims that Richard plucked up his doublet sleeve to his elbow upon his left arm, where he showed a shriveled, withered arm but Richard's remains have demonstrated that he didn't have a withered arm at all. So this just simply isn't true. We know also that Hastings, Archbishop Rotherham and Bishop Morton were arrested at the scene. Moore says of Lord Stanley that in the kerfuffle, a guard let fly at the Lord Stanley, who shrank at the stroke and fell under the table, or else his head had been cleft to the teeth, for as hastily as he shrank, yet ran the blood about his ears. It's interesting that not a single contemporary source even places Thomas Lord Stanley at that council meeting on the 13th of June, 1483. By the time Moore was writing, that meeting had become about eliminating support for Edward V. So I think Thomas Stanley inserted himself into that scene in a way that suggests that lots of the testimony that Thomas Moore was listening to wasn't reliable. Stanley wanted to do it to prove that he'd taken one for the team, to show that he'd supported Edward V, that he'd been loyal all along. But it simply isn't true. Thomas Lord Stanley, as far as we can tell, wasn't even at that meeting. He certainly doesn't seem to have been injured there. He was in high favour immediately after and appeared at the coronation of Richard III on the 6th of July in high favour. It makes the kind of testimony that Moore is relying on, the evidence from people who have been there, completely unreliable. Number eight, Sir Robert Brackenbury was so disgusted with Richard that he died fighting for him. Once Richard decides that his nephews, the princes in the tower, have to be murdered, he sends a messenger, John Green, to order Sir Robert Brackenbury to do the deed. This John Green did his errand unto Brackenbury, kneeling before Our Lady in the Tower, who plainly answered that he would never put them to death, though he should die therefore. Unperturbed by Brackenbury's refusal, Richard, sitting on the toilet just to make the scene completely ridiculous, complains to a page that he can't get anyone to do these things for him. The page mentions a guy outside the door named James Tyrrell, who was unknown to Richard, when in fact Sir James Tyrrell had been in Richard's service for years and years and was perfectly well known to him. Tyrrell heads off to the tower and gets the keys from Robert Brackenbury, who surely must have known what Tyrrell was planning to do with them. Brackenbury, a man who had refused to follow the instructions of this arch tyrant and yet remains in post and completely unmolested, allows Tyrrell to have the keys and go about his business. And then Brackenbury, who must have been obviously disgusted by what Richard had done through Tyrrell, appears at the Battle of Bosworth fighting for Richard, and he dies at the Battle of Bosworth fighting for Richard. If he was so utterly disgusted in Richard's actions that he refused to take part in them, 
Why would he be at the Battle of Bosworth dying for the same king? Number nine. The bones in Westminster Abbey can't be the princes. Moore gives us a graphic account of the murder of the princes in the tower before adding, he says of the king, he allowed not, as I have heard, the burying in so vile a corner, saying that he would have them buried in a better place because they were king's sons. Lo, the honourable nature of a king. Whereupon they say that a priest of Sir Robert Brackenbury took up the bodies again and secretly buried them in a place that only he knew, and that, by the occasion of his death, could never since come to light. If more is accurate and the remains were moved, then those dug up in the 17th century and placed in an urn in Westminster Abbey can't be the princes. So if the bones in the urn are the princes, then Moore is wrong and he's unreliable. If Moore is correct and is to be believed and relied on, then the bones in the urn can't be the princes in the tower. But Moore can't be right and those be the bones of the princes in the tower. The two are now mutually exclusive. Number 10. James Tyrrell never confessed. Very truth is it, and well known, that at such time as Sir James Tyrrell was in the tower for treason committed against the most famous prince, King Henry VII, both Dighton and he were examined and confessed the murder in manner above written, but to where the bodies were removed, they could nothing tell. Sir James Tyrrell was arrested in 1501 and executed in 1502 for helping Edmund de la Pole, a Yorkist claimant to Henry VII's throne, to get through Calais, where Tyrrell was in charge. During his trial, Moore tells us that Tyrrell was examined and confessed to the murder of the princes in the tower in the way that Moore has described it. Moore tells us that Tyrrell explained how he used two men, Miles Forrest and John Dighton, to do the dirty deed for him. Miles Forrest, we're told, is already dead, but John Dighton was found and brought in and questioned, and he agreed with Tyrrell. He admitted that he'd murdered the princes in the way that Tyrrell and then Moore had described it. There are two interesting things about this. We don't have any kind of confession from Sir James Tyrrell. And you would have thought that something so key to Tudor security, at a moment in which Prince Arthur, Henry VII's heir, had just passed away, and Tudor security was as fragile as it had been for years, a confession that the princes in the tower were dead and had been murdered by Richard III would have served the Tudor security so much that it would have been preserved and published widely. Yet Moore is the only source to mention the existence of this confession. We don't have a copy of it and no other contemporary writes about it. The second odd part is the ridiculous fate of John Dighton. Moore tells us, Miles Forrest, that St Martin's piecemeal rotted away. Dighton, indeed, walks on alive in good possibility to be hanged before he die. But Sir James Tyrrell died at Tower Hill, beheaded for treason. Wait. Dighton confessed to murdering Edward V and Richard, Duke of York, in the Tower of London and was set free. A confessed regicide was allowed to just wander around the streets of London. Seems odd, even in Henry VIII's England. Oh, and one of our most famous and, and greatest historians claimed to have solved this mystery definitively when he found out that Henry VII and Elizabeth of York had stayed at the Tower throughout James Tyrrell's trial to hear his confession and to hear the details of how he'd murdered the princes in the tower. But that would be ignoring the pesky little fact that James Tyrrell's trial didn't take place at the tower, it took place at the Guildhall. So if Henry VII and Elizabeth of York were at the tower, they weren't at the trial at the Guildhall. But why let pesky little facts get in the way of a good story? Moore certainly never did. Music